My life was saved. Now, I was very young, but what I remember strongly is well-meaning neighbors saying to me, aren't you lucky to be saved? Aren't you lucky to be saved? It's left me with the feeling that I need to justify my own existence. What would you like people to say? To say? Yeah. Well, she was worth saving. After some years, I cracked up from the trauma of coming to a new country, new language, new food, new parents. Women were not allowed to drive a bus, fly an aeroplane, work on the stock exchange, make sure that the men are allies and so that their daughters don't go through the same sort of problems. You are referred to now as Steve because you were unable to get meetings, to have phone calls answered with the name Stephanie. You are the first person to fall completely out of the Sunday Times rich list. My late son, Giles, was profoundly autistic. I got him into a little nursery school until he flinched when I waved. I realised somebody had been hitting him. What's the one piece of advice you'd give to people listening? Risk is not as risky as it might look. You restrict yourself so much if you don't take any risks and just stay within your comfort zone. And if you want a full life, if you want a, a meaningful life, Risk is probably a necessary ingredient. Hey there, it's Jake here. Listen, I want to say a massive thank you to all of our new subscribers, but you know, most people that watch this content on YouTube don't subscribe. I want to change that. The more subscribers, then the more amazing we can make high performance. And I've had a lovely message actually from Rob who says, I only recently discovered the high performance channel and I watched the full Eddie Howe and Tyson Fury interviews, both some of the best content I've seen in the last five years on YouTube. Listen, if you agree and you want to keep this amazing stuff coming for free, then hit subscribe right now. Thank you so much. Well, Dame Stephanie, welcome to the show. Lovely to meet you. Lovely to be here. What is your definition of high performance? Well, there's a good question to start with, isn't it? Um, High performance, I really think of in terms of cars. Not that I know anything about them, but I do know that High performance depends on speed, power, and the sheer joy of driving. They've got to be easy to use and and a pleasure to drive. And that's a definition of a high performance car. Now, speed, power, and friendliness, shall we say, um, is really something that defines the sort of work that I've been doing uh, for the last 50 odd years, but probably longer. Um, I enjoy my work. Um, I am quick. I'm not as quick as I used to be, but I have got high productivity and I pride myself on being able to work accurately and fast without making too many mistakes. I do make a lot of mistakes um, in management terms, but have learned to remedy them, brush myself down, put a big smile on my face and try again. Let's start there then. How do the people listening to this podcast learn to do the same? Because the fear of failure holds so many people back in life. Well, failure, of course, is when you learn. When you do something successfully, you know, yes, it's a pleasure, it's easy, it passes the time. Um, But when you make a mistake, you really learn from it and and come, you know, half an hour later, you are a better person, a stronger person, a more varied person, um, simply because you've made a mistake and had to recover. So let's talk about you. I'm sure you won't mind me telling the audience that this year you turned 90. So how much of the person sitting in front of us today remains shaped by her experiences of arriving here on the kinder transport as a refugee? Well, I think all of us, the crucible that builds our character is in our early years. And my early life as an unaccompanied child refugee at the age of five in 1939. Um, That really has made me, has driven me, has defined me, and in no way is that less powerful uh, today than it was 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, I mean, apart from the trauma of a a two-and-a-half-day journey Um, of a thousand children on a train with just two adults to look after us. Um, 
the the sheer coming to a new country, new language, new food, new parents, because I was fostered for many years, um, that has really driven me in that um, I can cope with that change. I've nothing else that can happen to me can 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 match up to th that change. And so I've become um, somebody who can cope with change, somebody who now likes change. And um, since I find myself in a position where I'm driving change, um, that's useful in a digital career. It's also made me very, very conscious of that my life was saved. Um, now, I was very young, but what I remember strongly is well-meaning neighbours of my foster parents saying to me, aren't you lucky to be saved? Aren't you lucky to be saved? And indeed I was. Um, but um, it's left me with the feeling that um, I need to justify my own existence. And that's not a healthy feeling for a six-year-old. Um, but uh, it has driven me and is still there. I like, I don't fritter my days away. I like to do something meaningful um, with my life, with my t the time that I've got. Um, and um, I think it all stems from that difficult early start. But it's a long time ago. I am now, as you say, 90 this year. Um, and... Um, I'm really still enjoying life. Um, I'm happier in the last few years, I think, than I have been for a long time. Um, my son was learning disabled, and so that put a slant on, on my life that other people have, wouldn't have experienced. I mean, your answer's absolutely intriguing, Dame Stephanie, that especially because it correlates with some fascinating research that's been done over the last 20 or 30 years. You use that term about the trauma of coming over on the kinder bus. And I think my, like many of us often hear about post-traumatic stress, mm. but its lesser known cousin is known as post-traumatic growth, where some people oh. use that trauma to find that sense of purpose, to give themselves a narrative of making a difference or allowing no day to go wasted. I think it is this struggling to give meaning to your life, that you're not just eating and drinking, um, that you, you actually have some meaning of the purpose that you're here. I don't have any faith, but I do have that feeling that um, it is the spiritual things in life that matter, friendship, music, literature, poetry, nature, Friends, love, these are the things that really matter. They're, they're, they're not all the non-material things. So how much, when you look back then to uh, uh, over the last 50 or 60 years of your life, what specific characteristics do you think have served you well that were we'll learned at that crucible? I think stubbornness, resilience, which is a term I only learned 10 years ago or something, um, but this business of... Um, entrepreneurs don't are not made by their successes. We're made by the fact that we can recover from our failures. And again, it's this feeling that, that light and dark, black and white, um, there is so much to life that to have it in a three-dimensional, meaningful way, you really have to have some um, inner drive that says this is worth doing this is what I want to do um, I don't call it work because there's nothing else I would prefer to, to, to be doing it's not just something I, I do when I'd rather be doing something else and um, I have that's why I say nowadays I have a very happy life um, and um, I have got rid of the depression that followed the survivor guilt that I had as a refugee um, so tell us more about that, if you will. Survivor guilt is that um, irrational feeling of guilt that you've survived when other people have not survived. And it can hit you when you've 
had an, an accident such as a broken leg, uh, but it most often hits when people have had real monstrous traumas in their life, uh, have been facing death and are conscious of that. So survivor guilt is, is a positive thing because it leads to um, that feeling of, 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 of joy that you have survived. Um, but it also has the reverse in that it can make you very depressed. Um, it just, I don't know what goes on in the mind. Maybe you know it better than I, but... What's interesting, though, is that you didn't just survive you thrived. And we'll talk in a moment about your businesses. 44% of the founders of the biggest companies in America are either refugees or the yeah. children of yes. refugees. So there is something really special here about not just surviving, but thriving from these experiences. And, you know, I think Damien and I both have that regular concern as parents of children that are born into lovely, happy families and nice, warm well, that's houses. That's what you aim to do for your children. Lovely education, of course. But then the question is, how do we, and how do the people listening to this conversation, create young people with the drive, not just to survive, but to thrive, when they haven't, thankfully, had to go through the, the traumas that you did? I think we can set our own targets that are really, really, really difficult to achieve. I mean, if it were easy, we'd all be millionaires. Uh, and it isn't easy, so you have to really um, set out a pathway that you can see into the future and that the, the steps are in, in terms of a week or a month, something really reasonable that you can, you can get hold of and, and say, have, have I done it this month? Have I done it this month? Am I better than last month? Am I better than three months ago? And this continual learning process is so satisfying um, if you have that sort of mind. And I think if you're an entrepreneur, you need that sort of driving vision. A, that you're going to move and you're going to move fast. And secondly, you know what it is that you're seeking. You may not get it, but you know what it is that you're seeking. So this is exactly what you did. You came to England. You were a refugee. You were fostered and then turned into one of the foremost tech pioneers in the world of everyone, not just of women. So how did it begin? Because I often think you have to see it to be it, but you, could, you didn't see it. No women were doing what you were doing. I loved mathematics. And in my first primary school, uh, which was a Roman Catholic convent, uh, the nuns um, couldn't teach me mathematics and said to my foster parents, this child is gifted in mathematics. She needs to go elsewhere. So I went, sat for a scholarship and to a grammar school where they did teach um, mathematics and uh, then we moved location and the school there didn't teach that because girls were not expected to learn science at all so I really had to battle to continue with my math studies and they actually sent me to the boys school this in the days of unisex schooling um, th that was a salutary um, introduction to the uh, sexism that I would later meet in the workplace. But basically, somebody helped me. They, they listened to me that this child wants to study mathematics um, and um, has the appropriate skills. And they helped me. They did, went out of their way to, to get me the tuition that I needed. And I never forget that. Would you tell us about the battle? Because I'm interested, because it, it seems to define a lot of what comes later, but this is a battle to be able to go and excel or just pursue maths. Tell us what were the kind of challenges that you faced that you had to overcome. So it was a battle to get your self-respect, to know that inside I'm just as good as you are. And it's up to me to show it and prove it and, and, and feel it. Some of the aspects of fighting, I think, are probably learnt early. I learnt I, if I wanted something, I had to fight for it. Um, I have a very clear um, distinction between right and wrong, and that has helped me considerably. Um, one of my few memories of my pre-refugee days was of um, going for a walk in, in Dortmund's um, 
one of Dortmund's beautiful parks. And um, treading as a three-year-old or something, um, for some reason, on a beetle. And my father, who was a judge and a very distinguished gentleman, um, absolutely hit the roof and he shouted. I've never heard him shout uh, before. Um, How would you like it if a great big foot came down and stamped on you? And that made a big impression on me. And it leaves you with this business that do as you would be done by. Um, Learn to walk in other people's shoes. Um, Make sure that the person that you are, that the person you are is, is a transient person. It's en route to something else. So one's energy needs to be directed not to what you want to do, but who you want to become. It's a sort of personality thing more than anything else. And I do think entrepreneurs have a special personality. Um, and then, well, you can tell me perhaps whether there are different kinds of entrepreneurs. I mean, today's entrepreneurs raise money very, very early, whereas we sort of crawl scratched our way up by our fingernails and um, I started with six pounds only finishing up with a uh, an organization that was valued at 2.8 billion dollars um, and um, so you, you you can see that I can drive things but how do I do it I'm not quite sure but I do it partly by example I don't ask anybody to do things that I wouldn't do um, they see me working just as hard as they are um, and um, so, I, in, in a way, I've developed my own style of leadership. So what was the business that you started then with six pounds in your pocket? And we have to try and work out how you managed to get to 2.8 <laughs> billion, because I think that's an interesting story there. Um, well, other people made that happen. Of course, it wasn't all me. Very modest. Um, software in the early 1960s was something that came free with the hardware. When you bought a computer, it came with its own software. Um, And what I did that was diversive, um, disruptive, was to think that software could be um, sold separately. Um, And people laughed at that idea, Um, but doubly so because I was talking about a software house Um, that was staffed almost entirely by women who were working from home with family responsibilities. So it started off as a social business, um, very clearly um, designed for women, uh, but using as its metrics uh, what um, how many disabled people are we employing, how many um, single how many breadwinner women are we employing? How many um, job share couples are we employing? Using social metrics rather than just the bottom line. And I noticed today that people are talking about not just the bottom line, the financial results, but the second bottom line, the social impact. What difference does it make? And goodness me, some people are even talking about the third bottom line, which is the environmental impact, which I... I it hardly gets mentioned these days, and yet it is so, so important. But can we just go back to there's two things in that in that answer that you've given. The first one is, how did you cope with the ridicule, the people laughing at this idea? But secondly, where did the idea even come from of, of doing things that today we're looking at and describing them as pioneering, of, you know, thinking about diversity agendas, looking at the social impacts of the work we do. You're doing this 50 years ago. Yeah, but where do ideas come from? Um, we're always taught to talk, to work in teams and, and to develop our team, team working. Um, but actually, innovation comes is a solitary matter. Um, to me, it comes sometimes when I'm sleeping. Uh, literally, I wake up in the morning with an idea. Um, or if I'm working on my own. I think it comes only if you actually know your topic. Um, otherwise, it's just dashing around in all directions. Um, 
But tell us about the courage to persevere when you propose an idea. And the first, I think it was Einstein that said that ideas are often ridiculed by mediocre minds. <laughs> so people are, are, are ridiculing this idea. Where does your perseverance or your courage to keep going? Tell us about that, what you've learned that you could pass on to our listeners. I think the benefits of person, persevering show themselves the first time you really take a project or a, a wish or a desire um, through to uh, fruition. And then you realize that there's a sufficient incentive to do the unusual, to do the disruptive thing that really makes a difference rather than tinker around the edges of something and slightly improve it or slightly modify it or take it to another country. Um, I've done all those things, but the ones that really matter are the innovative things. And in business, um, young people, young minds find it easier to innovate because they haven't got into a, a fixed, this is the way I do things. I'm always changing. Um, I do have systems and things that I always do in certain ways, but they're always open to amendment. And that sort of um, mindset is easier when you're young and it becomes more and more difficult as you age. Um, your performance also drops. Um, so I'm certainly conscious of mine has dropped, but I'm still... Still a high performer. I don't think there is a, a a woman living or working in the UK today that shouldn't be thankful for the pioneering drive that someone like you had all those years I ago. I feel I've done something for women. Yeah. <coughs> My impact on, on the computer industry has been different. I, I think I was one of the, the first, probably the second to really consider the, the social impact of computers as distinct from their technology. And I've done something similar in the year 2000. Um, I was the founding funder of the Oxford Internet Institute um, at a time when people were wondering if the, if the internet was here to stay. Um, and I'm very proud of that. And that concentrates on the social, economic, legal, and ethical issues of the internet, not the technology. So I've, I, I, I tend to stick to those sorts of things. I, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I was a technician. I did just help design computers, uh, but in a very minor sense. Um, I was much more a software person. And I think one would say a human resources person because I do really respect the people that I work with for their skills and their abilities. And we will talk about how you respected them in just a moment. But before we get there, you know, I really want people to understand the person that they're listening to right now. You know, the level of the work that you were doing means that the software for the first black box in Concord was programmed by women working from kitchen tables, working for your business, that you had the idea to hire and to build and to create in a world where it wasn't happening. So that's the level of the work you're doing. Yet at the same time, you're calling yourself Steve and you are referred to now as Steve because you are unable to get meetings, to have phone calls answered with the name Stephanie. The world in which you are operating is a world unrecognisable, thankfully, to my daughter and to Damien's daughter. Well, this is why it's important to, for, for women to hang in together, um, make sure that the men are allies and so that their daughters don't go through the same sort of problems. I mean, there are still remnants of, of sexism quite strongly in the workplace, um, but it's nothing compared to what it was. And it's not a legal thing. I was battling against legal uh, issues. You, women were not allowed to drive a bus, fly an aeroplane, work on the stock exchange. Uh, have a bank account. Have a bank account. I mean, in, in the States, I recently learned that women were not allowed to have a credit card um, until the 70s. Wow. You know, very late. And I was 62. So they're legal things, but what about the more pernicious elements of sexism? What were oh. some of the examples you could share with us that, that give us some context? I think it always helps if you can laugh at a problem. Um, and um, I learned to laugh off and brush off 
um, the ex most examples of, of, of sexism. Um, I became quite assertive, uh, I, but hope not aggressive. Um, in my first job, when strong young men would offer to carry my equipment for me, um, I, I would say, I believe in equal pay and will carry my own things. And I mean that. If you want to be treated as, a, as an equal, you have to do the equal job and, and pay the equal penalties of, of so-called success. Um, people think success is easy, but it's quite difficult to, to, to deal with, and failure is even worse. So how do you feel all these years later that in the UK, for example, less than 10% of the leaders of FTSE 100 businesses are female, or that only 20% of the tech business employs women. It's absolutely disgraceful, and I've been saying this for 50 years, and I'm turning into a bore. Um, I think really the women have had it very tough um, in the past and still in the present. The young women that I speak with, um, I talk about examples of sexism. I don't mean sort of rape in the station recovered, but I do mean, uh, I mean, when I was selling... I used to get my bottom pinched. And, you know, you're trying to sell a six-figure software business to some junior minister, and he's trying to pinch your bottom. I mean, it's, it's very hard to sort of retain your, um, your natural humanity. Mm. Of course. So, well, tell us then, what kind of things can we do to, to try to challenge the the sexism that still exists, maybe not as extreme as you describe, but what kind of allies or what advice can you give to people that want to be allies to change that? I mean, allies are people who do things to help, but also they speak out um, the slightest racism or sexism. or um, you, you speak out and, and make sure that everybody knows that that is not um, acceptable uh, in, in your presence. And... It may mean I've turned into some, somewhat of a prig, but um, I, I, I don't put up with certain behaviours. Quite right. Quite right. You mentioned how much you like to reward your staff. I think this is the next example of your pioneering mindset. So you've set this business up, you've created a business by women, for women, and then this business is valued at billions of pounds and the moment comes when you get the chance to sell. And in the process, 70 of your staff become millionaires. So again, in an era where shared ownership of businesses was absolutely not the norm, and even in an era now where every time you turn on Instagram or listen to other podcasts, it's all about making yourself as rich as possible and as successful as possible, where did the desire to share your wealth come from? Well, I think my colleagues had helped me build the company to an extreme extent, in the early days of the business, we paid not particularly well, but reasonably, um, but we paid very slowly. And the staff accepted that. They were all freelancers and, and consultants rather than salaried staff. Um, and when we got out of the 70s recession, it, it seemed obvious to me that the people who had helped me through that period um, should should benefit from from the upcoming successes. So many people though don't think like that though, do they? They they see the success of a business and they think, "Well done, me." They oh, don't realise no. that life's a team sport. If, if I have any skill, it's in it's in encouraging young people to grow into really good leaders. Um, I notice the same is happening in my charities. The, the, the top management is now people that worked with me 20 years ago and um, whom I've selected. So I, I, I like people. Uh, they don't necessarily like me. Uh, <laughs> I, it doesn't worry me. Why do you say that? Uh, because I've had failures with people and um, I think... It doesn't worry me because I, I want to be respected rather than liked. It's nice if you get both. But I was talking about something else now. For you. No, no, but, but this is a fascinating area that lads like pursue that these people that you've selected, whether it's in the charities that will come to in a while or in the business when you first set it up, 
What were the kind of characteristics that you were looking for to make that selection decision? I was with one of my charities recently and somebody used the expression value recruitment. And I always question things if I, if I don't know what they mean. So I sort of said, what's that? I haven't heard that term before. And it is recruiting not on performance, um, but on values. And I realised that that is how I have always recruited people who know the difference between right and wrong, who are ambitious, who are stable. Um, we've had our mis mistakes <laughs> there as well. Um, but I, I'm definitely recruiting on values. And some of them are black and white issues, but the rest are, are these... I, I want to surround myself with, with people who are better than I am in, in, in all the different varieties of work. And it's so exciting when, uh, when you're building up a business to suddenly find that um, you've got not one person who can do this, but perhaps two people who can do this. And then you've got a div little group that can do this. And then you've got a division that can do this. And it gr gradually grew to it. We employed 8,500 people when we were taken over in 2007. Um, so, but it wasn't me that did it. I'd got professional managers in by that time. And we have many entrepreneurs and business owners that listen to this podcast. What, what is the key question you love to ask when you're hiring people? I usually ask about mistakes, in that it tells you a lot about the attitude of people, not about the mistake, but about their, their attitude to, to things that go wrong. What's your biggest? Fairly classic one. Um, I had a success in the UK with my company and I tried to replicate it first in Denmark, then in Holland, then in the States. And none of them really took off. I mean, they survived. They washed their face. Um, but um, eventually all three were closed down simply because they were just taking so much management effort. And that's a classic mistake of, of thinking that um, an idea that was innovative at one time would transfer later to another country where it might or might not have been innovative. That um, that attempt to go international um, taught me a lot. One of the things that happened thinking about working internationally. And, you know, if you're doing, doing something at all, it's, it's got to be disruptive, it's got to be different, and it's got to be big, which probably means it's got to be international. But I started thinking at, at the time when Asia was coming forward that we could export the writing of software to India and did a very crude feasibility study of that. Um, it was a very cheap labor force at that time, and I was writing papers about it in the computing, computing world. 20 years later, uh, we actually had 4,000 people working in India. Um, it was no longer a cheap labor force. It was a labor force in short supply, um, and the whole scene looked very different. But most of the things that I've done have taken a long time, 11 years to go to co-ownership, 17 years to take my first charity to sustainability. These are long periods, obviously, in parallel. Um, I think that is an intriguing area to explore, mm -hmm. though, Steve, in terms of the power of patience. And you've obviously demonstrated a real aptitude for that. What advice would you give people listening to this about the benefits of patience and indeed how they can nurture that? Well, if you're patient, you've always got some hope that you're going to get out of this muddle and, and things will improve. Um, and in general, things do improve. They can improve. And if you have the right culture in a business, they will improve. Um, I'm a great... I espouse working as a team to deal with problems, to go for successes, um, to mourn the losses, um, 
but I've always made it a habit still to celebrate when we've had to close a business down, for example, we always finish, down, finish up with a celebration, getting everybody together, having a lovely meal out and plenty of wine, um, and making sure that everybody knows this was a good job. All right, we've had to close it down. There's quality work done here. Mary did this. Jo Joe did that. Um, and that sort of... Um, th there's, there's no time to just feel... Sorry for yourself that this has happened. We're just moving on. Mm. I love that. Patience buys you hope. I'm going to live with that one from now on. I want to move on to the, the next um, part of your story. And I understand that this, is, this may well be quite emotional and very close to home for you. I want to talk about Giles, your son who was born. Tell us about him. Well, my whole life changed from being a scientist to being an autism worker because my late son, um, Giles, was profoundly autistic. He'd been born a much-wanted, desired baby, um, a beautiful baby boy, and I know every mother thinks that. Um, but um, he, he was lovely, and it started off... I'd aim to give him a very calm childhood because mine had been so turbulent. Um, so we did leave, live quietly in the country um, until at the age of about two and a half, um, Giles changed over a matter of days between being a, a calm, happy baby to being a wild, unmanageable toddler hyperkinetic, um, totally unaware of danger, lost eye contact, and he, he went through what's called a regression. And there are a few illnesses and things that have regression, and autism is one of them. So it seems that autism was something that he had from birth, but only exhibited itself later on. And it has set the tone of the whole of the rest of my life. What do I do this morning? I'm writing things on autism. I'm reading papers on autism. Um, it's, that's what I now do because, again, I'm driven by that inner compulsion that I don't want other children to be br brought up in such an alien environment as um, many autistic children have to cope with. I got him into a little nursery school um, for one term until he flinched when I waved and I realised somebody had been hitting him. Um, when you've got a child that has lost speech, um, euphemistically one says pre-speech, but actually it means no speech. Um, so Giles did not speak again ever. Um, so I took him away from that school and, and had him at home and then found a little um, weekly boarding school, which was very good for him. And really, what I've learned is that autistic children need a very structured environment. They need teaching in a different way, um, and they need a lot of patience in order to get that hope, I suppose. So how did, how did you remain hopeful through all of this? Well, I didn't, because after some years, I cracked up um, and had a good old-fashioned nervous breakdown, finished up in hospital. And because I was the carer for Giles, he also had to go to hospital. Um, and he spent the next 13 years in a mental health hospital. It's an asylum, really, uh, where they contained him. Um, we visited every week, and he, first of all, we brought him home for one night. Then we couldn't manage that even. So then we just visited there. Um, places like that don't have um, facilities, really, for visitors, because they have, they have very few visitors. The people there are largely isolated and neglected. Um, 
So we used to visit every Saturday and spend the day with him picnicking in the grounds. So we'd take a picnic and it was something he likes, food. And, and so we had some semblance of family uh, family life together. That's fine in summer. It sounds quite idyllic as the hospital had good grounds. Um, but then in winter it's not so funny when you're sort of cowering under a heat-reflecting sheet in order to have some sort of time together because there were no facilities for visitors. And then things got more difficult in the hospital and I was no longer happy with the care that he was getting because I had been happy, basic though it was, I had been happy with it. And my business being successful by then, we decided to look after him again ourselves this time with paid help. Um, and so we started, we had, a, my mother died and she left us a little bit of money and we bought a tiny little cottage near the hospital so we could take him out to the hospital. Um, and then we employed staff that would look after him there during the week. Um, then we employed more staff and looked after two people and three people, and we made it into a charity. And today, that charity, of which I'm enormously proud, gosh, it cost a lot uh, in pain, not money. It cost about two or three million. Um, but in pain, it, it, was, it was very hard to get going, especially in a way because my Giles was one of the people there, and at the same time, I was trying to chair the trustees and make sure that we did the the right thing but nowadays Kingwood it's called autism at Kingwood Kingwood is where we used to live um, looks after 150 people sort of modeled on my Giles these are people with profound autism um, and looks after another 100 people with Asperger's so the pe people of high intellect who um, can live independently and need sort of one day a week making sure that all is well, checking up on their money, checking up on how they're doing. Um, and that serves five counties of, 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 of England. Um, can I ask you about the moment that you described where, where you suffered a nervous breakdown yourself? Because as somebody that I'd lived through some of the trauma of your childhood and then you've gone and revolutionised um, the workplace in the ways that you did. What did you learn from that period where you did break down that allowed you to come back galvanised and stronger to make a difference in the charity sector? That's a good question. I learned that I was not superwoman. I learned that I couldn't go on doing it all, running a business, running a family, um, struggling with to get schooling for my Giles and so on. I learned to say no to the many requests that I get. I learned to um, take care of myself, um, mind, body and spirit, um, so that I now do take time for myself. Um, I swim two or three times a week. Um, I make sure that um, my lifestyle is, is, is healthy um, and I do things for pleasure. And I used not to do that. It used to be all work. Mm. And uh, so I did learn quite a lot. So I don't think I'm in danger of breaking down again. No. And your idea of not all work is probably different to lots of people's because, you know, you still work very hard. Giles sadly passed away at the age of 35. How much of the energy that you have now for the autism charities that you set up remains from, from the love you had for your boy? Oh, entirely. It's not something I would have ever thought was suitable for me or in, in any way. Um, surprisingly, both after the death of Giles and the death of more recent death of my husband, I had a sort of burst of creative energy. And you, 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 you sort of think, was that being blocked before because I was so focused on... On, on on family matters, um, but had enormous energy, not necessarily highly productive, but it was enormous energy, a um, bit like women get just before they have pregnant, before they have their babies, you get this some nesting. 
And what emerged from those creative periods? A lot of new projects, um, new ideas. Um, I mean, ideas are very precious. I mean, I don't have many ideas. They have to be captured. And even before you develop them, you've got to remember them. If you first thing in the morning you wake up, wouldn't it, about doing something, you, you've got to write it down, otherwise you'll lose it. Um, I think the other part of your story that I want people to understand is that you didn't just set up an autism charity with the billions of pounds you had in the bank and give a, a few thousand to charity. You are the first person to fall completely out of the Sunday Times rich list. You, <laughs> yes. I'm very proud of that. Are you? Tell <laughs> yes. us why. I didn't know it was going to happen, but no, it, it is. Um, I, I don't want to finish up in penury, um, but I am basically giving. Um, all my money away, because what else can I do with it? I have no family. Um, I enjoy my work. I, I understand the autism sector, and that's where I now put money in. Um, I used to support the IT sector, but uh, lots of people do that. And autism, I'm a major player in the, in the sector, and I feel I've made a bit of difference there. I would also say you're an autism entrepreneur, though, because it's one thing to take your money and give it to charities that already exist. It's highly entrepreneurial to decide to build charities, build foundations, hire people, run PR campaigns, yeah. generate awareness. All the things you had to do to create a business, you've had to do to create the charities that people you have. People think philanthropy is very, very different to business. It isn't. I find it very similar. The only difference is that the metrics are social rather than financial. Um, I find your ones doing exactly the same sort of thing, feasibility studies, impact assessments. Um, but it's of, of a scale at the moment that I can, can manage quite easily because I aim, if I set up a charity, the aim is for it to be sustainable, by which I mean managerially and financially independent of me. And that, my first charity took 17 years and my second charity took five years. My third charity took two years. So you can see I'm a learning person. Um, but th those are long periods of time to make sure that the charity is stable, that it's got its risk assessment, it's got its personnel policies, it's got its, uh, it's set up as a corporate that can survive on its own. Um, and um, Autistica, the third charity that I set up is probably the most strategic of the lot, but it's the smallest. So they're all very different. But we interviewed um, an American author called Mark, called Mark Manson, and in his book he talks about how lots of successful people often indulge in what he calls it immortality projects. So it's the idea that they want their name to live on in perpetuity. And yet what's significant about your example is that this seems incredibly selfless rather than selfish. So what's the kind of legacy that you want to leave behind with these charities? Well, if you'd asked me that two or three years ago, maybe a bit longer, I would have sort of said I'm not interested in legacy at all. I haven't had things named after me and, and so on. Um, but then I closed down the, the foundation, the Shirley Foundation, and saw... Um, an old-fashioned paper file of all its minutes over 25 years or something like that. And I thought this really should be saved. It's the story of a successful charity um, that was set up, run, and closed down professionally. Um, and so I approached Kent University, who have some specialization in charity work, um, and they were interested, and it developed into... Um, putting the Shirley Foundation into their archives. And I found that was very satisfying. So the foundation is, um, was going to last forever in its archives. Um, but that grew, really, that I then started thinking in terms of legacies. And um, today, I am interested in legacy. I am interested in, I think it's a matter of age, it's as simple as that. Um, I'm interested in how I'm viewed um, 
by the next generation, um, has all the work and effort paid off. I would say resoundingly, yes. Um, but there's always a little bit more that one can do. I think that's the way to end before we move to our final quick-fire questions. Dame, thank you. Dame, Stephanie or Steve, um, what would you like people to say? To say? Yeah. Well, she was worth saving. I think that's the... Uh um, Because I'm still stuck with that refugee. You know, once a refugee, always a refugee. So do you think that you were then? Do you, we talk often with people on the podcast about there is no yet, there's no end. It's all about a process. Have you, have you come to terms with with this in your own head that you've absolute, that absolutely you were worth saving? You have done more than you could have ever imagined, or is it still a battle? That it's, it's not a battle anymore. But I I, I don't fritter days away. Yeah. I, I feel that I need to justify my own existence. I, we, I mean, we never went on holidays, really. I mean, we had one or two, but um, it, it, just to be living and eating and enjoying and when there are things that need doing that I can do. So our quickfire questions. What are the three non-negotiable behaviours that you and ideally the people around you would buy into? I believe that I... Want always to be calm. I don't mm-hmm. want to lose my temper, and I did when I was much earlier. Um, and I haven't lost my temper for twenty-five years. Um, calm, yeah. And polite. It sounds a wishy-washy word, but that that I go into a meeting intending to work with others, to listen to the others, um, and come to some joint conclusion rather than tell them what I want them to do. Um, And that's held me in good stead. I I like to be humorous. In in my public speaking, I I do use jokes, uh, usually at my own expense. Um, But sometimes they're sort of snide, sexist remarks that for for women's organisations I can say all sorts of things. I do talk a lot for women's organisations. International Women's Day is coming up in March um, and um, that always focuses attention on the role of women worldwide, even today. Well, can I ask you, uh, this isn't part of the quick fire, but you've got this brilliant book out, which is a yeah. curated version of your speeches, so oh, to speak. Well, I've got other books as well. No, no, I, I, I know you have that. Hopefully they're going to be made into TV series. But I want to ask you about one of the speeches here about why do uh, ambitious women have flat heads? You need to explain that to us. Well, in 2015, I spoke to the TED organisation in Vancouver and they're very good at actually making sure that their speakers give, as they say, the very best speech of their life. And they certainly gave, got, got that out of me. Um, very careful briefing, very careful practice runs and so on. Um, and I wanted to liven things up. And it was a very serious talk. And, um, I put this bit in that... Ambitious women have flat heads and they're flat because so many people have patted us on the head (laughs) and said, there, there, dear, it'll... (laughs) So that's why women have flat heads. So you've explained that. There you go. It's in the book. So what advice would you give to a teenage Stephanie just starting out on your journey? Well, I suppose the uh, one advice is that it'll be all right. Uh, a positive thing, you know, start off, uh, concentrate on things that you know and care about, um, take a risk. I haven't talked much about risk, but take a risk and then just do it. Um, if it succeeds, all well and good. If it doesn't, you can always start something else. You don't even have to give up your current job in order to start a, uh, to do a startup. Um, you, you can work evenings and weekends to see if the startup um, has a chance of success. Um, and it is so exciting and you get so much of it. I Go ahead, go ahead and I'll help you. 
I love that. And the final question, and risk may well come into the answer. For the people that have listened to this compelling conversation, your one golden rule for them to go on and live their own high performance life. Think always in terms of doing the right thing, not just doing things right. What a finish. That. Listen, on behalf of both of us, the whole team here at High Performance, and, and but for people that you've inspired, thank you so much for joining us on High Performance. Thank you for your kind words. Um, and you have a, a couple of books in front of you, which is an exciting project for you. Well, Let It Go was written in 2012 and was revised in 2019. By, it's published by Penguin and is a memoir. Uh, it's not a, an autobiography in that it's not factual in the sense that it was Thursday afternoon and I went to Buckingham Palace to get my medal or whatever. It's talking about moods and how I felt about things um, and how um, relationships, I think, as, as we've been talking today, are so important to me. Um, it's not exactly a bestseller list, but it has sold very well. It's been published in German. Um, and is just currently being translated into Spanish. Oh, wow. Um, so it is beginning to get, get known, and it will be the basis of uh, a TV series. We hope, watch this space, and something will happen. We have, um, we have a high-performance book club, thousands of members, and they talk and they share books they love. If you were to contribute one book to the high-performance book club, what would oh, it be? Oh, of course it would be my own, wouldn't it? Apart from your own. You're not <laughs> yeah. allowed to mention your own. <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> That's against the rules. What would you go for? Oh, my goodness me. Probably something like Anne Frank's Diary of a Young Girl, Diary of Anne Frank, something like that. And we also have a subscription service of people that, that, uh, that are keen for more information on this. And I know that you said that we haven't spoken a lot about risk. What's the one piece of advice you'd give to people listening about risk? Risk? is not as risky as it might look. Um, there are so many opportunities to recover from poor decisions. Um, you, 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 you restrict yourself so much if you, if you don't take any risks and just stay within your comfort zone. Um, and if you want a full life, if you want a, um, a meaningful life, risk is probably a necessary ingredient wonderful what a way to finish thank you so much honestly did you enjoy it well, have you enjoyed it no <laughs> no <laughs> that's honest <laughs> thank you sorry just a quick one to say thank you so much for watching this content on the High Performance channel. We would love it if you would subscribe. You know, most people that watch what we do don't subscribe. If you can subscribe, we can make this bigger, better, bolder than we've ever done before. So hit subscribe right now and help the High Performance podcast make a real difference to the world. See you soon.